Welcome everybody to our next talk, UNI, Let's Fight Internet Censorship Together. When you think about internet censorship, I guess that a lot of people would just have an association with countries like China or Iran or Saudi Arabia, but not a lot of people are aware that filtering and blocking of websites and internet censorship also takes place in almost all the other countries around the world. And this talk will educate you about this. Our speaker is Arturo Filastro. He is the founder and developer of Uni, and he will tell you more about this super interesting project of his in this talk. Please give him a warm round of applause. Thank you, Miriam. Hi. Um, I guess I would like to start with thanking you and uh, sort of uh, expressing how much this is an honor for me to present this project. Uh, in front of an audience like CCC. Uh, I've been coming to, to these events uh, since uh, I was just, uh, just over 18 years of age. Uh, and so I think this project uh, and, and also the, a, a large part of my adult life is uh, also due to the encounters and the things uh, I have learned at events like this. Um, and so um, to get right into it, um, I think... Uh, the first thing that we should start with when uh, talking about uh, a project like UNI uh, is understand what we are talking about. So um, to frame what, what we mean when we say uh, internet censorship. Um, because um, these, uh, these... There is some uh, video connection. Okay. Yeah, so what is internet censorship? Um, within uh, the context of UNI, when we talk about internet censorship, uh, what we mean is uh, uh, some form of uh, network interference uh, that uh, um, comes with intent uh, to disrupt or distort uh, the reality of, uh, of the internet uh, from the perspective of a country or a network. Um, so it means that it, it uh, requires um, intent from the censor to uh, create this uh, altered uh, view of what is uh, um, the internet. Uh, another term that we use to uh, uh, define uh, internet censorship is, uh, is a filter net. Uh, and what we'll see in, uh, during the course of this presentation is that there are, in fact, many filter nets around the world. Uh, and that depending on uh, in which country you are in, uh, and depending on the, on the regime uh, or uh, the ideology of those uh, in power, uh, different views of, uh, of what is acceptable and not acceptable to be done on the internet uh, are uh, enforced. Uh, and so UNI, or the Open Observatory of Network Interference, uh, is this uh, network measurement project that was started back in 2012. Uh, and it's a community-led uh, uh, um, project uh, that's composed of a network of volunteers uh, that uh, install this software and uh, collect uh, evidence of internet censorship around the world. Uh, since uh, um, until uh, today, we have gathered uh, uh, measurements from uh, over 200 countries, uh, and uh, we have uh, measurements coming in from uh, uh, tens of thousands of different networks every month. Um, but the, the, the sort of founding principles uh, around UNI and the reason why uh, we decided to um, work on this project uh, is that we, um, we want to sort of bring uh, to the field of network measurement, and in particular uh, the field of network measurement applied to uh, detecting uh, uh, network interference uh, and or internet censorship, uh, the principles of openness and transparency. Uh, so UNI is uh, uh, open methodologies, uh, which means that all of the tools and techniques that we use in order to um, examine uh, internet censorship are openly documented and specified, uh, sort of like uh, in RFC format. And, uh, and these uh, uh, allow people to um, validate that uh, what we are claiming to do is uh, actually reasonable and, uh, uh, and, and fair. Um, the, the methodologies that, uh, um, that we um, that we specify are then implemented using uh, open source software. Uh, so you can verify that what we define in the specification is in fact uh, consistent with what is implemented. 
Uh, and all the data that is collected by the uh, thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of volunteers around the world uh, are made available openly as open data. So anybody can use this data for their own purpose and uh, uh, sort of from, from the beginning to the end of the chain uh, validate that what we are doing is in fact um, correct and, uh, and reasonable. Uh, and, and hopefully, by doing all of this, uh, we will reach at some point uh, a, a, sta a, a stage in which uh, we, can, we can say that what we are doing is in fact reproducible research. So that um, every step from uh, the definition of what you do to the implementation to the publication of the data is entirely reproducible. All of our uh, tooling, like all of our backend infrastructure, even our sysadmin scripts are made available openly, so anybody can set up their own uh, uni if uh, you know, they wish. Uh, but before going more into what uni is, um, I would like to, to give you uh, a, a taste <coughs> of what, um, what is possible with this sort of research, uh, as in what are the sorts of things that can be discovered by um, collecting network measurements uh, around the world. And these are obviously just some um, small samples. Uh, you can learn more about each of these cases by reading our full-length reports. Uh, but this is sort of more to show you what is the kind of impact that um, a tool like Uniprobe can have in, um, in, in the world. So the first case I would like to talk to you about uh, is uh, one that maybe you have heard in, in the news, or maybe not, because it was not covered as well, uh, and it's uh, around the, the protests in Ethiopia uh, in uh, December of, um, of last year, 2016. Uh, these protests sparked uh, in a particular reg region of Ethiopia called the Oromo region, uh, and they were around some uh, conflict uh, related to uh, uh, the expansion of uh, a certain city, uh, of, of the, the borders of the city Addis Ababa, uh, that would, uh, in a way, um, in sort of basically kick uh, people out of their homes because uh, they would suddenly have a big uh, uh, house, uh, like a big city in, uh, in where they live. Um, and so this, this led to some very uh, serious protests that were very violent, and uh, uh, the police was also very um, brutal to the, to the protesters, uh, and it led to many deaths. Um, and, uh, and as a result of these protests, uh, uh, also some uh, uh, network interference was done. So in order to uh, stop uh, the protesters from communicating and organizing, uh, WhatsApp was blocked. So the protesters could no longer uh, coordinate or uh, organize themselves. Uh, and, and with Uni, we gathered evidence of this. So we could prove in an undeniable way that WhatsApp was blocked, uh, that deep packet inspection technology was being used, uh, and we were also able to uh, understand precisely how it was working. Uh, that allowed us even to give some um, advice of what uh, some site operators could do to uh, even circumvent it in some way. Uh, and many websites, uh, from media outlets, uh, uh, human rights websites, and obviously political opposition websites, uh, were found to be blocked during this period. Um, Following this, in, in Ethiopia, uh, the state of, a state of emergency was declared uh, starting from October 8, uh, 2016, uh, just until uh, a couple of uh, some months ago, August 2017, so lasting 10 months. Um, but what's interesting from this uh, um, sort of case is that what we found evidence of is actually blocking uh, and censorship being implemented before the state of emergency. Uh, which, in theory, was something that was not uh, supposed to be allowed. Um, and together with uh, Amnesty International, uh, we published uh, a research report uh, outlining our findings uh, and um, sort of providing evidence that uh, this was something that, that was in fact happening and, and was uh, clearly um, not something that... Uh, um, a, a clear human rights uh, violation. Um, another interesting uh, case uh, that uh, we worked on together with our, uh, our partner, uh, our Malaysian partner, Sinar Project, uh, was uh, um, published in May 2017, and it was a, a sort of a study of uh, internet censorship in, uh, in Indonesia. Uh, we found uh, that uh, many um, 
many sites of uh, various categories were blocked. Um, but I think the, one of the most interesting things from, uh, from this particular report uh, was the fact that um, we collected measurements from um, around 60 different networks. Uh, and based on these, we were able to see that there was actually very much some difference between the different uh, operators in terms of what was being blocked and what was not being blocked. Uh, so as an example, Vimeo and Reddit um, were found to be blocked on certain internet service providers in Indonesia, uh, although the ban for blocking such websites was supposedly lifted two years ago. Um, and this stems, I guess, from the fact that uh, uh, the Indonesian legislation uh, states that uh, internet service providers uh, are, are granted the authority uh, to inhibit or block content uh, that is considered negative content, uh, and they are um, left on their own to make this uh, judgment call of what constitutes negative content. Uh, and as a result, you see uh, 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 quite some variation in terms of uh, which sites are blocked and which are not blocked. Um, and this is why it's, it's important, even in places where uh, you may say you know that censorship is happening. Yes, you may know that censorship is happening, but you don't necessarily know uh, what the censorship uh, of your neighbor looks like, even if uh, they live in the same country. Another um, very interesting report that I think uh, we could spend an entire um, one-hour uh, talk just uh, uh, discussing about uh, uh, this uh, particular country uh, was published in September 2017, um, and uh, it was uh, on uh, the country of Iran. Uh, and there we found uh, an astounding uh, number of, uh, of, of websites to be, to be blocked. Uh, I think uh, in, uh, in total we counted 1,020 uh, uh, and, and URLs um, blocked. Uh, ranging from all sorts of uh, various different categories. Um, and without going too much in depth into this, uh, what, what, what I should say on Iran is that it's definitely one of the countries that has uh, the most uh, state-of-the-art internet censorship apparatuses, uh, and they implement the most uh, um, sort of advanced forms of internet censorship. Um, and, and two interesting aspects that are unique to this country, I think, are one, that the censorship that they implement is uh, done in a, let's say, non-deterministic fashion. Uh, what this means is that you will visit a website, and it's not that every connection to that website will be terminated uh, immediately or every time you visit it. They will just selectively drop some packets, uh, every certain number of requests, uh, leading the user to think, in some cases, that uh, uh, the website is not, in fact, blocked, but is uh, just unreliable or not, not functioning properly. Um, the other aspect that we found uh, that was quite interesting uh, is, uh, given the fact that we analyzed the corpus of data dating back to 2014, we were also able to track the evolution of censorship over the course of these years. Uh, and one of the things that we found uh, was that uh, uh, certain websites, uh, such as Instagram, Instagram uh, that previously they were blocking only specific posts, so specific images or specific uh, pages on the site that were deemed uh, um, sort of unacceptable or uh, uh, against uh, the, um, you know, the, the morale of uh, the majority. Um, but as Instagram rolled out HTTPS on all of their websites, uh, the Iranian government was put in a situation where they either blocked all the website or they could not block the specific pages. And so, I mean, I guess this is more something to reflect upon of how um, sometimes something that you take as just a, a positive thing, and it clearly is a positive thing to have uh, websites uh, implement HTTPS and have uh, uh, secure connections to them. Uh, but it does also lead sometimes to some, uh, some effects that are not, uh, uh, not expected, maybe. Uh, and this is an example of it. So now Instagram is entirely blocked uh, in, um, in, in certain networks in Iran. Another case that probably you have heard about um, happened in, uh, in Spain just a couple of months ago. And it was uh, around the uh, Cat Catalonia independence referendum. 
And um, there was uh, some uh, movement to uh, do a referendum to claim independence from Spain uh, for the Spanish region, uh, Catalonia. Uh, and uh, as a result of this, uh, the Spanish government uh, decided that uh, one, one way to uh, sort of uh, ob create an obstacle for uh, the success of this, uh, uh, this movement uh, was that of, uh, of implementing censorship and blocking websites. Um, I think the reason why this is something important to, to talk about uh, here in Europe is that we should not forget that uh, these things also happen in our home and that oftentimes when we uh, talk or think about internet censorship, uh, we, we think as it's something that uh, happens only uh, over there. Uh, but in fact, many countries in Europe implement censorship for, for gambling or other reasons. Uh, and it's kind of a slippery slope because once you have the infrastructure in place, uh, that can be used to implement internet censorship, uh, those in power um, can possibly abuse it to, uh, you know, do things that uh, are clearly not acceptable. Uh, and so during the Catalan referendum, 25 websites were blocked. Uh, the .cat uh, registry was raided by the police uh, and they forced them to uh, take down uh, or block a series of uh, .cat domains uh, that were uh, hosting just information about the Catalonia independence uh, uh, referendum. So, I hope this has given you an idea of uh, what are the sort of things that can come out of uh, um, running a software like Uniprobe and uh, collecting this sort of evidence. So now what I would like to uh, talk to you a bit about is the uh, sort of ecosystem of uh, Uni software, so the various software components that uh, make up Uniprobe. Uh, and all of the things that you he see here are uh, open source. You can, uh, uh, like, uh, you know, git clone them and uh, hack on them uh, to, uh, um, to your pleasing. Um, and uh, and the, the, the first thing that, uh, that, that I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a bit about is, uh, is the sort of engine that uh, Uniprobe, uh, the client that we use to run the network experiments, uh, is, uh, is uh, based on, and it's called Measurement Kit. Uh, and this is a C++ library uh, that uh, we use uh, to implement uh, all of our network measurement uh, experiments. Uh, and it currently uh, supports uh, Android, iOS as our two primary targets. Uh, but it also works on any Unix system, uh, and we are um, in, in the process of uh, um, ensuring that it works properly on Windows as well. Uh, we have JNI and Node.js bindings, so you can uh, include this library inside of a, a project of yours uh, where you need to do uh, some particular experiments that uh, uh, involve uh, measuring networks. As I said, the tool that we use to uh, collect network measurement uh, data is Uniprobe. Uh, we have an Android and iOS app uh, that you can download on your, on your phone. Uh, it's also available on Afdroid. Um, we have uh, Mac OS uh, and, and Linux uh, as well uh, in the form of a web UI. Uh, so, um, but we are also working on a um, more fully featured, proper desktop client that will uh, uh, support also, uh, also Windows as well as Mac and Linux. And the sort of tests that, that we do, uh, as I guess uh, you, you, you somewhat understood from, from the, the, um, the, the, the case studies, uh, are, are mainly around these sorts of uh, uh, categories. So we have tests that examine uh, web censorship, so whether or not a particular website is blocked or is not blocked. Uh, we check to see if instant messaging apps like uh, Facebook Messenger, uh, Telegram, WhatsApp, etc., uh, work or do not work. Uh, we have a series of tests for censorship circumvention tools like uh, Tor, uh, VPN, uh, Lantern, Siphon, etc. Um, then we have some tests that uh, sort of are more trying to understand uh, certain characteristics about your network. So whether or not a middle box, uh, so something like a transparent HTTP proxy or something that uh, is intercepting your connections uh, and forwarding on them for you is present on your network. And more recently, we've started to have also tests for examining speed and performance. This is how our, uh, our mobile app uh, looks like. Uh, 
uh, you can run it on your uh, on your phone and uh, and check to see uh, what is blocked or not blocked on your network. Uh, and by doing so, you're contributing uh, to our global understanding of internet censorship around the world. Uh, this is our, our desktop client that, as I was saying, is a web user interface. And this is another uh, interesting thing that we have recently launched, uh, which is, is sort of a way for you to also engage other people uh, to monitor or uh, stand up for, uh, against internet censorship uh, for the things that you care about. So with Unirun, what you can do is you can add a list of URLs that you want to monitor. So for example, um, let's say an uh, um, animal rights uh, uh, activist group uh, in Germany wants to monitor some German websites. They will create uh, an Unirun link. Uh, and when people click on this, if they have the app installed, the app will open and will offer to test the sites that they want to test. Uh, so um, we obviously also accept contributions for, uh, or, or suggestions on what we, we should be testing. But um, you can also do this on your own with Unirun. And as I was saying, all the data is available uh, as open data. So you can uh, um, access the Uni API, visit the Uni Explorer, uh, and uh, and, uh, and, and use the data in your own studies uh, to, uh, to uncover evidence of, uh, of internet censorship. Not sure why that is. Uh... Um, so this is Uni Explorer. Uh, this is a global data map, and it shows all the measurements that we have. You can browse through it to uh, understand what is blocked and what measurements and what data is available uh, in the various countries around the world. Um, as I said, we also have an API that's more oriented towards, uh, let's say, developers or data scientists. Uh, so you can query this API and uh, obtain the raw data. Uh, and all the research reports that we write are actually all based on, uh, on the same data. So you can write your own research report on a country that you care about just by accessing our data, which is all, all, um, all as open as it can be. So, Get out there and uh, use Unidata to uh, understand better what is happening uh, in the countries that you care about. And to close, what uh, I would like to leave you with is um, sort of another story, I guess, uh, about uh, a trip that uh, uh, some of the Uni team uh, did to Cuba. Uh, and I have um, a video here that uh, I'll I'll use to uh, support uh, the narration of the story in a way. Um, and, um, and yeah, so this was in spring 2017. Uh, and um, a second, let's see a second if we can get this to start from the beginning. OK. OK. The audio is not playing. Yeah, so without further ado, I will uh, tell you the story of our, uh, of our trip to Cuba. And the data that you see here is, uh, and the facts here are obviously during the trip. Some things have changed since we went there, uh, but uh, um, you can find more information inside of our, uh, of our research report. Many of us take the internet for granted. Many of the things here at CCC would not be possible without it. But imagine living in a world where access to the internet is not ubiquitous. That's the type of world most Cubans live in. This is a story of our spring 2017 trip to Cuba, exploring its internet landscape. Simone, Maria, uh, Leonid, uh, Joe, and all of the other Unitarians that are here uh, have uh, this would not be possible without them. So this is also for, for all of them. Most Cubans cannot access the internet from the comfort of their homes. Rather, they need to visit designated public spaces that offer internet access. Welcome to Parknet. 
This park, along with many others across the country, serves as a public Wi-Fi hotspot. Such hotspots were set up two years ago in 2015, when the Cuban government provided public access to the internet for the first time. Most hotspots are located in parks, while others are located in other public spaces, like post offices and airports. In a way, Cubans don't access the internet; they visit it, and so it becomes a sort of collective experience, especially at night. When the heat is more tolerable, dozens of Cubans gather in these hotspots to use the internet and to chat online with their friends and family. To start browsing the net, you need to have an account issued by Atexa, Cuba's only telecommunications company. Atexa sells these cards at $1.5 for one hour of internet access. You can also purchase these accounts. From resellers who lurk around in park nets, but they will mark up the price to even three or four dollars for only one hour of internet access. We are curious to explore whether and to what extent internet censorship was implemented in Cuba, and so we run our network measurement software called Uniprobe, as well as a variety of other network tests. Based on our measurements, we found 41 websites to be blocked. More might be blocked as we limit their testing to a list of sites created by country experts. Most of the sites that we found to be blocked include news outlets and blogs, as well as pro-democracy and human rights sites. Many of them seem to have one main thing in common: directly or indirectly, they express criticism towards the Cuban government. Other circumvention tools, like the Tor Anonymity Network, were found to be accessible across Cuba. Our software not only allowed us to confirm whether sites were blocked, but it also allowed us to collect network measurement data that clearly shows how censorship is implemented. Etexa appears to be blocking sites through the use of technology that resets connections or serves block pages instead of the intended web page. In many countries around the world, when a website is blocked, you know it because it often looks something like this or this. Block pages usually include some information not notifying you what, that the site is blocked, and sometimes even include a reference to the legal justification, which means that it may not always be clear that the site is intentionally being blocked. Users might assume that it's a connectivity issue rather than government commission censorship. But Etexa isn't the only ISP in the world to serve blank block pages. You see this in many countries as well. Interestingly enough, we only found the HTTP version of the sites to be blocked. And the HTTPS is unblocked, meaning that、uh, people could circumvent it using HTTPS. However, many sites that we found to be blocked do not support HTTPS. Chinese vendor Huawei appears to be supporting Cuba's internet infrastructure, and you don't even need to run any tests to find this out. The server header of the block pages, for example, points to Huawei equipment. Even a Texas captive portal itself. Uh, seems to be written by Chinese developers, since they left over some comments in the source code of the Captive Portal page. Overall, internet censorship in Cuba does not appear to be particularly sophisticated. Given the high cost of the internet, rendering it inaccessible to most Cubans, perhaps the government doesn't even need to invest in sophisticated internet censorship. But Cuba's internet landscape is changing, and so might internet censorship. That's why we think it's important to monitor networks continuously. Users in Cuba and around the world can run Uniprobe to shed light on information controls. Thank you. A. I think I finished right on the dot,、yes. so I suspect Perfect. that.、Uh... <laughs> Thank you very much. So, everybody in the audience who now got curious about Uni, maybe you want to consider if you want to contribute by running an Uni probe in your own country or when you're on holidays in some interesting places. Just think about whether you would like to contribute and help Uni out. And we have an assembly on、uh, in the CCL、exactly. at the second floor, the Universe.、Uh, if you have more questions about Uni, you should come and join us upstairs,、uh, and we will be happy to answer any questions you may have. Exactly, perfect. Check them out in their Uni assembly. Please give another big round of applause to Arturo. Thank you very much.